Happy Friday, womenpreneurs. I hope that this week has been fruitful and a blessing in whichever way that it could be a blessing. Um, I don't know if you can tell in the change in my countenance and my voice. Maybe it shows in my eyes. I'm a little tired today. I actually slept in today. I slept in quite a bit today. I'm going to go to bed pretty late this week. And, uh, but it hasn't stopped me from showing up here, has it? We're still on track with our commitment. However, I couldn't think of anything of value to put together for you. So I have decided to go back into my archives and share with you a video that I created a year after I was diagnosed with cancer. So some of you may or may not know, I am a cancer warrior diagnosed three years ago with stage four metastatic breast cancer. I'm fine. I'm not suffering besides some hot flashes due to my treatment, but it's, it's really nothing compared to what some people do suffer when they are going through different kinds of treatment. So I just wanted to share with you, um, you know, it took me a year to share this message because I felt for a long time, like, you know, what difference is it going to make to talk about my diagnosis. Lots of people, you know, have a cancer diagnosis. And it wasn't until someone pointed out to me how my story could really help to elevate somebody else. Someone today or tomorrow or next week is going to get word that they have um, an illness, um, possibly terminal, and they may not know how to take it. Um, and I wanted to share this video when it finally hit me how my story can help somebody else. That's when I felt like, okay, I'm going to go live. I went live on my Facebook and um, shared the story about my diagnosis, but also how I'm handling it. As you can see, I'm doing fine. <laughs> um, you know, are there hard days? Not really. I don't think about it like that. I honestly don't. And um, I would encourage anyone else, you know, as long as it's not causing you any pain or suffering to just you know, this is an opportunity to live your best life. Do all the things you ever wanted to do. Don't hold back on anything. Get toxic people out of your life. Number one, <laughs> I fled. Okay. I fled Montreal. Number one, because I wanted to restart my life. Um, I wanted to restart my life. I wanted to create a whole new life for myself. But another part of the reason why I fled was to get away from toxic people, a toxic person, if I'm being uh, exact. And so get toxic people out of your life. It's really not going to help you at all. Um, but hopefully you get something out of this video. It is probably the biggest piece of value that I can give you. It's to just, you know, keep on living, design your life the way you want. Don't wait, don't wait until you have, you know, an illness diagnosis to be able to do the things that you always, always dreamt of doing all the desires of your heart, Start acting on those things now because we don't know how long we have. My doctors have given me, they said five years when I went for my, my diag when I had my diagnosis three years ago. So I would be on year three of five, but I honestly believe I'm going to live a long time. I have so much ambition in my heart. There's so much work that I want to do for the kingdom of God. And there's just so many lives to touch, you know, with this story. And so my hope is that you walk away feeling enlightened, inspired, um, motivated to move forward and finally walk into that life that was created just for you so that you can impact others. It's always about how can we impact others? If you're living a life just for yourself, you know, what kind of life is that? Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video. All right, let's do this. This has been a long time coming. Uh, talking about my cancer diagnosis. Um, it didn't happen recently. I was diagnosed with breast cancer last year, October, so it's been an entire year. Diagnosed with breast cancer um, at the time, uh, I was still going through a number of tests and scans and blood work, and so um, by December, we found that the cancer had spread to my liver which puts me at stage four cancer um, I've heard it been referred to as a terminal illness and 
before I knew more much about um, stage four cancer, I was under the impression that um, stage four wasn't a huge deal. <laughs> it's actually quite funny. Uh, so I was under the impression that there might have been a stage five, six, seven, eight. And so when I learned that I was at stage four, I thought, well, things are not so bad. Um, only to find out that stage four is the very top of the line. You don't get any higher stage than stage four. So for those who don't know uh, stage four cancer, there's no cure for it, even though it looks like it's going away, which was my recent uh, prognosis. It looks like it's going away, but at some point it gets clever and it comes back. And um, so that's, that's pretty much where um, my... That's pretty much where my um, my stage is, is at stage four. Uh, so recently I went to my doctor for one of my regular checkups and we found that things are actually looking good. When I started my treatment, um, the lump in my breast had pretty much gone away. I also had one in my lymph node under my arm and that had gone away. And the one on my liver had shrunk and then according to my most recent doctor visit, um, the one in my liver had shrunk even more. So it's looking good. Uh, but according to my doctor, what the doctors say, that's what will normally happen. It will start to go away and then after a while it will find its way to come back. So that's what uh, stage four cancer normally does. It starts to go away and comes back. Um, so. You know, the year has been quite interesting, especially after um, learning that I had breast cancer. Um, you think that would be devastating enough. Uh, like I said, there was a, there were a number of... Um, <laughs> I had like two uh, biopsies of my, my breast, my left breast. And then I had um, MRIs and CT scans and bone scans. And then my liver biopsy, the first liver biopsy, didn't pull enough of a sample to, um, to be able to uh, identify if it was cancer. So I had to do a second liver biopsy. And it was just a whole bunch of in and out before they could even determine if the cancer had spread. And then finally, um, they found that it did spread to my liver, putting me at a stage four. So how am I feeling about all of this? To be truthful and honest with you, I'm living my life. <laughs> my life has been so much more fruitful since this cancer diagnosis. It put me in a completely different category of living. I don't at all feel like curling up and die, which, which apparently is the norm. When my doctor told me that I was, um, you know, positive for stage four, and that it had spread to my liver, she looked at me in my face like she was waiting for me to break down and die right in front of her. She was just like, you're at stage four. And it's, it almost, it's almost like she wanted to cry. <laughs> and I just said, okay, then let's, you know, get on with life. Um, what, you know, what do I go on to do next? What's the treatment? What uh, what's my life going to be like going forward? And to be honest, I feel totally fine. Not everyone who has cancer is, uh, someone who's going to curl up and die. There are a lot of us who are living life, living with cancer, doing things differently. So kind of a, a bit of a backstory is that, um, some of you know, I was, uh, back and forth, um, to Montreal and Toronto for five years because uh, at, a, at the time when I had started going back to Montreal, I had fallen on hard times. My business was not thriving. And so I needed to take a step back, go back home, collect myself. And at the time I heard a lot of people say, you know, a lot of people do that. When they fall on hard times, they go back home for a little bit for a year or two and they get back on their feet and they come back. So I was home for five years. I was just comfortable <laughs> in my house. And, um, I came back to Toronto with a determination to live life. So this is before I even knew I had any kind of a cancer. And my plan was to come back to Toronto, get a full-time job, um, 
and just do things differently. Even with my finances, I said, God, if you give me a second chance, I'm going to budget. I'm going to save money. Um, I'm going to work out, you know, take better care of myself. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to do all the things that I should have done the first time I moved to Toronto. And so I came back uh, with all this determination. I was going, I was job hunting, looking for contracts, people who wanted PR. A lot of people know me to do uh, public relations and branding, looking for contracts to do PR and branding. And um, at the time when I got the breast cancer diagnosis, everybody, especially my family in Montreal, was telling me, come back home. Come back to Montreal because you're going to be going through chemotherapy and you can't rely on a friend to take care of you while you're going through chemotherapy. And I just felt like at the time we didn't know for sure. I didn't have my final diagnosis. So like, I'm not going to pick up and go back home until I know for sure that I can't handle it here. So I had a friend, big up to Effia, Effia Hector, who was uh, <laughs> incubating me for a while, uh, who was uh, willing to take a chance on me and say, listen, back going back to Montreal is not where you need to be. You need to be here. And everybody who was here agreed, do not go back home. And I was determined to stay. I said, I'm not going to just give up and go back until I know for sure uh, that I can't handle it here. And so I um, so I stayed. I stayed. I continued looking for jobs. I continued going to doctor's appointments. Um, when I when my surgeon first told me that I was going to have to go through chemo, she advised me that if I ever wanted to have children, I should go through the process to freeze my eggs. So I was doing that at the same time. Um, you know, that uh, requires injecting yourself with a needle two, three every night to uh, get your eggs to a form that they can extract them and freeze them. Um, and then going to my doctor's appointments and that's, you know, blood work every time. And um, it was just a really messy time. Everything was up in the air, to be honest with you. It's like my in entire future went blank because as much as I came here with a lot of determination to live my life over again, getting a, a diagnosis of cancer, um, my future went blank. I had no idea what I was going to do next. Like, if I have cancer and I'm laid up because of chemotherapy, uh, what's going to happen after that? So I was just kind of going through the motions. I got up every day. I was still sending out my resume. I was still, you know, going to my appointments and still feeling like, you know, there's a ray of hope in there. And um, at the time, my doctor had, did tell me that if I was diagnosed with, uh, they call it metastatic cancer, which means it has spread, then they wouldn't put me through chemotherapy. That I would just have a simple treatment that would keep the, the cancer from growing and spreading in my body and that um, they would shut down my ovaries uh, so that I wouldn't be having a regular menstrual uh, cycle because the cancer that I have, um, it's, I should really know these terms, but I don't. It's a hormone, it's, it grows by hormones. <laughs> so they shut down my ovaries and uh, give me a treatment to uh, keep hormones um, and stuff like that from affecting the cancer. So uh, if that was going to be the case, I thought to myself, well, why am I going to go back to Montreal if I'm just going to have a simple treatment that's not going to take me out? And so in the end, um, when it turned out to be stage four, uh, you know, hallelujah, I don't have to go through uh, that kind of chemo because uh, some may know that my mother had breast cancer. She's now five years in remission and she just doesn't wish chemo on her worst enemy. It's just something that really, it's a poison that it takes over your body. You can't do anything. You could barely wipe yourself, which is why a lot of people were telling me, uh, you know, come back to Montreal. Don't put it on a friend to have to take care of you in that condition. And so in the end, um, I ended up staying. And uh, lucky for me, I didn't get a job, but I did land the contract, the opportunity of a lifetime. This is an opportunity even bigger than any job would have served me and uh, that happened last year December and again my life has been so much more fruitful <laughs> since this diagnosis it sounds it might sound bad for some but um, for me I've said this before and I'll say it again it's been a blessing because right now it's keeping me in line uh, in line with my promises to take better care of myself, to keep myself happy, to 
live the life I always wanted to live. There's no more seeing the life I want to live and saying, well, one day. No, today. Today I'm going to do that. Oh, I feel like going shopping today. I'm going to do that. Um, oh, I want to plan a trip today. I'm going to do that. There's no more waiting. It's really about jumping in because the truth is um, when you're diagnosed with stage four. So what my doctor originally told me, she's like, it's going to reduce the amount of your years of life significantly. That was her first comment. And then when I went back to her the second time and she actually um, she confirmed that it was uh, stage four. Uh, she said, yeah, I've had lots of patients. They go on to live for 15, 20 years. And to me, that was my biggest thing. I want to, I don't want to leave this life unfinished. There's so much that I wanted to do. Like I said, I had just come back to Toronto and I wanted to uh, live a different life. So I'm like, how could I have just come back and I don't get an opportunity to live this life that I've been talking about? And so um, that's one of the times that I actually did cry very hard. It's just knowing that I wouldn't get an opportunity to do everything in this life that I wanted to do. And um, it was just a lot of back and forth. I remember a lot of you know I started a magazine. So at the time when I was going back and forth on whether or not I had, um, on whether or not the cancer had spread, I was starting a magazine. I did a photo shoot. You all saw pictures and videos. Uh, I was getting the magazine out. And in the meantime, you know, my life was in limbo. I had no idea where my future was going. So it was a pretty, um, that was a, that was a very convoluted time to be honest. Um, but one of the times I, I cried was really not knowing what my future was going to be here. I had started this magazine. I had just come back to Toronto and ready to start this new life. And, um, it might've all just been going to nothing. Uh, but then receiving the final diagnosis, uh, really cleared things up for me. Just let me know that you know, I don't have to live according to my diagnosis. I can live the life that I came here to live. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. So, um, so yeah, this is me finally talking about it a year later. <laughs> uh, and this is not uh, by any means, you know, why did I take so long? You might be wondering. Um, a large part of me taking so long had to do with fear as anybody would be and not realizing that uh, this story could help somebody else so that's the message that has been coming to me recently it's that here I am holding on to this story that could comfort somebody that could bring them some peace that could bring them some hope and some joy and I'm just keeping it to myself for selfish reasons um, and recently over the past few weeks months I've realized that there are people out there who need to hear this. There are people out there going through a hard time that, you know, if they could just have a ray of hope, uh, get some perspective, um, then it, it could be helpful. So, you know, I don't like to think of myself as having a terminal illness. I always say that life itself is a terminal illness because nobody here is promised to live forever. So don't sit there and be sad and cry over the fact that I'm dying. You're dying too. <laughs> We're all dying. <laughs> uh, and it's nothing to be sad about. It's actually a beautiful thing because uh, once you're living your life fully, then there's really no regrets. You're doing everything that you want to do. You're prioritizing yourself. You're making yourself happy, which is the most important thing. I, f I think we get so caught up in the, man the mundane and the minutia, and it's killing us, literally. Stress is a real thing. Like, I honestly believe that my years of um, going through a hard time and just not knowing where my next dollar is coming from and how am I going to pay my bills and I need contracts and not getting callbacks for jobs and things like that. It created such a stress that it quite possibly created this, this illness in my body and not to mention toxic people, get toxic people out of your life immediately. It's not worth it. I know we might be concerned about their feelings. <laughs> One thing I can tell you is that I can no longer concern myself with people's feelings. Um, a lot of people who are close to me uh, complain that I don't call. And, you know, don't take it personal. I don't call anybody. I'm just not a phone person. I It's just 
I can't. So, um, and I used to feel bad because I know that people want to hear from me, but I can't afford to feel bad for people's feelings. People who are with me, ride or die, whether I talk to you every month or every year or every two years, they know. I can call them up and it's like, hey, how you doing? It's, and things are all good. And if you have people in your life who are going to put you down and make you feel bad about anything, just that's the one thing to <laughs> not have in your life. So um, I don't want to get into a whole this is how you should live life thing. This is really just me telling my story um, and for anybody out there who needs to hear some good news. It's that there is life after cancer. You can live a life with cancer. It's really the treatment <laughs> that's killing people. And if you do, if you are diagnosed with cancer, I highly recommend watching uh, The Truth About Cancer. My career coach, uh, Michelle Nadon, she's amazing, uh, referred me to that documentary. And it really talks about how um, the how chemotherapy is, is really killing people. Doctors are mandated, they are obligated to prescribe chemo even though it's very harmful, it's a poison literally in your body, and um, and it's killing people. Meanwhile, doctors who are going the the natural route are um, they're getting in trouble for it. <laughs> they're getting in trouble for telling their clients about drinking soursop and all these natural things to cure their cancer. That is that's actually helping actually healing them, and they're getting in trouble for it. So you know you decide what's good for you or not. Um, so just, yeah, just know that, um, you should really be your best ally when it comes to working with doctors and anything like that for your health. Just really do your research and, and know a lot about that. And, um, when it comes to treatment, um, the cure for cancer, let me tell you what the cure for cancer is. Okay. If you're paying attention, anybody who's out there, I'm about to reveal the cure for cancer. The cure for cancer is in prevention. So going back to what I said about taking toxic people out of your life, eating healthy, doing the things that make you happy. Don't stress. Don't worry about things that don't uh, deserve your worry. Just, and I know that just saying this is not enough. I know that everyone's going to go about their lives and do the things that they want to do, but I'm telling you right here, right now, <laughs> the cure for cancer is in prevention. And it's unfortunate that I took so long to start eating healthy and working out and just living a better life, but at least I still have the opportunity, which is what I'm so grateful for. And things will come and hit you and um, it it will be shocking, but you really have to assess, is this worth the energy and the pain that I'm going to feel and that could possibly create any illness? And I'm not even saying cancer is the only illness that can come up in your body from any kind of stress. People have heart attacks, people have diabetes and any kind of, any kind of illness you can think of. I strongly believe it's a result of uh, the things that we allow into our world, into our environment. And then um, what we're doing from an, from an internal perspective, how we're feeding ourselves, uh, prayer, meditation, um, me days. Chantal Amsterdam can tell you about me days, <laughs> how important those are. And so uh, I just strongly urge everybody to, um, again, I didn't want to come and preach, but <laughs> strongly urge everybody to um, do what you can to make yourself happy. Prioritize your happiness, even if you have children. So... I don't have children, and I can't speak to what it's like to have children, but I did hear a woman say at the Black Moms Connection Summit that she never prioritized her daughter, <laughs> and um, she's better for it, her daughter's better for it, because you always have to put yourself first, and I hate giving this analogy, but everybody talks about putting on your mask first when, you're, when your plane is going down, and then helping somebody else. It's really all about putting yourself first, and... Um, and being grateful and just, you know, there's so much stuff that doesn't matter. I beg you, please don't get to a cancer diagnosis before you realize this truth that I'm trying to tell you. It's all in, 
it's all in how you treat yourself. You are the most important person in your life. Wake up in the morning, thank God for life on that day, and then think about you and what you need for that moment, and then carry on your day from there. Um, that's really all I can share about the cure for cancer. <laughs> that's my cure for it anyways, although apparently, according to my doctor, it's too late for me, but I'm determined to still live my life. I, I don't feel like I have... Uh, cancer. I don't feel like I'm dying at all. I exercise uh, two days a week. I'm in my dance class one day a week. I do yoga sometimes. Big up to Nadia for hip hop yoga. And um, I walk every day because <laughs> where I work is a distance from the subway station. So I get to walk every day, get my steps in. And life is great. I have no complaints. I have no want for anything. I'm 100% okay. Uh, I thought I might cry during this live, but um, it's not happening. I think I've cried all my tears <laughs> early when I was diagnosed last year. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to share. A lot of people haven't heard this yet. A lot of you are hearing this for the first time. Uh, know and believe that when it was first going down, there was a lot of people I was talking to. My phone wouldn't stop ringing till this day. I have put my phone on silent because the sound of my phone ringing gives me anxiety and I can't afford anxiety in my body. So my phone is always on silent. So if you call and I miss your calls because my phone is silent, nine times out of ten, I'll call you back at some point. Um, but what I don't want is for people to start calling me. I'm totally fine. You don't have to call. I'm doing great. You can send me a message. I do great with messages, uh, texting if you have my number or Facebook Messenger. Um, don't call, don't cry. Uh, I'm often <laughs> uh, careful about how I share this information. I try to be in the room with people because I don't know how they're going to react because they might need my consoling <laughs> about my diagnosis. Uh, it sounds backwards, but um, it's true. I've heard of people breaking down a bit and I'm like, I'm sorry, I can't be there to, you know, give you a hug. So, um, so yeah, that's where I'm at. Diagnosed one year ago stage four it's the top not like i was thinking i thought there was a six seven and an eight stage four is the top of the line uh, and i'm doing well with it i'm not by any means uh curling up and die i had to ask my mom she was with me in my last appointment and i said why is it that the doctors and the nurses always sound so surprised when i tell them that I work out and I um, I work uh, a job and that I'm you know living life and she's she's told me a lot of people would curl up and die to know that they had this diagnosis and I cannot fathom I, I have no idea what that looks like or what that feels like to just say to just throw in the towel and give up and say well that's the end of my life let me just give up on life and that's just me um, and it's largely because I operate by the grace of God. I have to give all praises, all praises to God. He's number one in my life. Jesus has saved me in ways above and beyond what we know about the work that he did on the cross. And uh, he's been working in me for a long time. I must say I've studied the Bible for years and I've been walking with him for years and just knowing the truth, knowing his word. Uh, I have a rebuttal for every lie that the devil could tell me. Uh, even when I got this diagnosis and I might want to believe that this is the end of my life. But uh, the word of God is etched on my heart. And there is nothing that the devil can tell me that I can't come back and say, oh, <laughs> that can't be true because God says this. Um, how did Jesus used to say it? It is written. <laughs> so I always have that recall. It is written. You know, the word of God has saved me in so many ways. And I'm not here to preach that you all should be a believer if you're not. But if one thing has kept me strong in all of this, it's it's God and his word and his truth and his promises and I will never deny him. He is my rock and my fortress. Uh, I came to learn some time ago that my last name, Gabriel, means the strength of God. And I walk with that. I hold on to it so tight because it's the one thing that tells me that he lives in me. And 
if nothing else, I know that I can depend on him and that he's going to see me through everything. So if I had to redo this live, I would have started with that. <laughs> but it was about telling the story and hoping that it reaches anybody who needs to hear a positive word about something that they might be going through, whether it's um, an illness or a death or a hard time, people in your life are acting crazy. Just know that you are a priority and not everything is for you to, um, to take it on so deeply. A lot of things do not matter. Just imagine anything that comes to you. Just imagine if I had a few years left on this earth to live, would this matter to me? And if your answer is no, bless it and move on. That's all I can tell you. So I don't want to take up your mornings. I actually have a busy morning. I want to get to some things, need a new phone, but uh, feel free to send me a message. I am open to messages. Please don't call. <laughs> okay, if you want to call, go ahead and call. But like I said, my phone is on silent and I'm terrible at calling back. Uh, I apologize <laughs> for anyone who's called and um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you for tuning in, everybody. Uh, finally, it's out that I was diagnosed with cancer. I'm happy that I was finally able to share this message one year later. Um, but my true deep down hope is that uh, this will help somebody to know that um, there is hope and there is life after cancer. You don't have to curl up and die. You can actually get up and live and walk strong. And, um, and that's my message to you. God bless all of you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Ciao.